I'm Susan Hillier and I'm from the University of South Australia. I'm one of the deans for research in allied health and human performance. I'll just take this opportunity to acknowledge that uh, we're meeting, most of us are meeting on Ghana country uh, and to acknowledge the ongoing relationship that Ghana elders have with country, uh, elders of the past, elders of the present and emerging leaders. I'm really delighted um, to welcome two fantastic colleagues, Claudine Bonder and Natasha Harvey. And we were just saying with our restructure how much I'm, I miss working with them because uh, we're now in separate academic units. Um, I think you'll really enjoy hearing what they have to say. They're great citizens as well as great scientists. So firstly, um, let me introduce Professor Claudine Bonder. Um, Claudine's an expert in vascular biology and she's trained both here in Australia and overseas. She heads the Vascular Biology and Cell Trafficking, Trafficking Laboratory uh, within the Centre for Cancer Biology here. Uh, and so she's in the, the Bradley Building um, in, the, in the ABMC um, precinct, if you need to find her, CCB levels uh, in the Bradley Building. Um, she's been awarded many things. I've been to quite a few award ceremonies and, and clapped Claudine, so that's a great privilege, including you know, from early career research awards all the way through to um, Tall Poppies and a Leading Light finalist and Women in Innovation and, and the list goes on. So I'm delighted to welcome firstly Claudine. Um, Claudine, if you'd like to start sharing your screen. Thanks for having me everyone. Uh, thanks for joining in and I'd like to share just a snapshot of our work on uh, targeting the blood vasculature for better health outcomes. Um, okay, so my laboratory is particularly interested in endothelial cells that form the inner lining of all vasculature of the circulatory system. And uh, we have three research programs, one on bioinvisible devices, another on improving vasculature for islet transplantation, and the third in targeting the tumour vasculature to fight cancer. And it's this uh, program that I'll speak to today. So um, we are very familiar with the statistics that by the time we reach 85, one in two Australians will have experienced cancer. We're also familiar with the evidence that if a tumour can remain small and be surgically removed, then your survival rate stays high. But if that tumour grows and metastasizes, then that survival rate significantly decreases. And this is true for most uh, solid tumours, including breast cancer and melanoma. In fact, a solid tumour can only grow to about a millimetre cubed before it needs access to a blood supply. And until recently, it was believed that this process was driven solely through angiogenesis, which is the proliferation of endothelial cells and the extension of existing vasculature. But more recently, we've come to understand that um, cancer cells can de-differentiate and form vascular structures on their own. And this process is called vasculogenic mimicry. So vasculogenic mimicry or VM can be identified through histology where an antibody to an endothelial marker such as CD31 can identify angiogenesis and there by default identify vasculogenic mimicry. And a number of studies with thousands of patients have, has identified that a number of solid tumours use VM to progress and the most invasive and aggressive cancers use it mostly. We know that uh, Vasculogenic mimicry uh, is associated with cancer cell differentiation, metastasis, and is a predictor of poorer survival outcomes, such as that indicated in the graph on the right. And we and others have shown that in solid tumours of the tumour vasculature that's there, the vasculogenic mimicry comprises about 30%. So how do we better understand VM and what it contributes to cancer progression? We can use a number of different assays, including this in vitro matrigel angiogenesis assay, where traditionally we would seed endothelial cells onto this gelatinous substance and they form vascular structures. But quite strikingly, aggressive cancer cells in this same assay undergo VM and form um, vascular features that are very similar to endothelial cells. Studies have shown that VM competent cancer cells switch on many endothelial cell genes, they release anti-clotting molecules, the metastatic cancer cells exhibit a VM phenotype, 
that anti-angiogenics actually accelerate this process and that these tubular structures can actually flow blood through them. Importantly, not all cancer cells form, form VM. This is a pancreatic cancer line that is VM competent, but this is a pancreatic cancer cell line that is not VM competent or VM incompetent. So understanding the difference between these two might actually save lives. In breast cancer, we've used an in vivo model to show that, again, the vasculogenic mimicry comprises about 30% of the tumor vasculature and that those cancer cells have elevated gene expression of endothelial cell markers, as well as other genes that contribute to the tumor vasculature uh, and um, tumor microenvironment, I should say, and are responsive to hypoxia. In melanoma, we've um, identified an adhesion molecule called desmoglein 2, which we um, know is elevated in some melanoma samples. And when elevated in patient samples, they lead to a poorer outcome for these patients. When we knock down DSG2 with a small app, um, siRNA, for example, we see that these cells can no longer integrate and bind to each other, and they can no longer form these VM structures. And in vivo, we've shown when we target DSG2 that these tumours are smaller. So from here, what we're doing now is to work with uh, Professor Nico Volker at Monash to generate these porous silicon nanoparticles. We're loading these with DSG2 targeting siRNAs, coating the outside with a DSG2 binding peptide to ultimately inject these IV into tumour bearing mice um, so that we hopefully will see an inhibition of tumour growth. Our preliminary in vitro studies have um, confirmed that our melanoma cancer cells take up these sRNA loaded nanoparticles. And when they do so, their production of DSG2 protein is significantly reduced. Another area of active research in the laboratory is about the immune response. So typically we want more cytotoxic T cells to come in and, um, and target the, the tumour and reduce tumour growth. And these cytotoxic T cells are in circulation. They uh, engage with the vasculature through different adhesion molecules to get into the tumour and start their killing. But what we don't know is what vasculogenic mimicry does. Maybe because this, these are cancer cell derived, maybe they specifically recruit pro-tumorigenic cells such as CD14 monocytes. And maybe they use different adhesion molecules um, to get access to the tumor at large. So to better understand that, we've done a comparison of, of um, endothelial cell and their adhesion molecule profile. We've compared adhesion molecule profile with uh, VM competent cancer cells and also a VM incompetent cancer cells. And you can quickly see the similarities between these endothelial cells and the VM competent cells. So using that information, we've begun to ask how the cancer cells might be recruiting um, circulating cells. And in a parallel plate flow chamber assay with uh, under shear stress, we've shown that these VM competent cancer cells selectively recruit pro-tumorigenic monocytes. And in a Boyden chamber um, uh, transmigration assay, we've again shown that the um, VM competent melanoma cells re selectively recruit the pro-tumorigenic monocytes. So to ask um, how we can interfere with this process, stop the VM from having an active process and active recruitment um, of the circulating cells and thereby promoting cancer progression, we've started by looking at the ability to block certain proteins such as ICAM1, which is one of the adhesion molecules. And when we do that in an in vitro assay, we see that there's a significant reduction in these VM competent cancer cells from binding the CD14 pro tumorigenic monocytes. So what we've done here is to, um, just to, to summarize, is we're beginning to understand how these solid tumors grow. It's not just through angiogenesis, but it's also through vasculogenic mimicry. 
And these two processes begin, uh, they use similar um, recruitment um, assays um, and mechanisms to um, determine the immune response. So if we can target any or some of these, we can potentially prevent angiogenesis and vasculogenic mimicry, prevent tumour growth, and um, allow for better survival outcomes. And this is particularly important for, say, pancreatic cancer, where the survival rate for five years is less than 10%. So there is much work to be done in this space. Finally, just to acknowledge my awesome team in the lab, um, our extending um, collaborators, our funding bodies, and also a big shout out to our consumer advocates, in particular Trish, Trish Fuss, um, featured here, who is our biggest supporter. That's all I have for today. I'm very happy to take any questions um, either now or um, you know how to reach me. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Claudine. Oh, I froze for, for a minute there. Um, so we do have the question and answer room where you can type in your questions. Um, in the meantime, I might just ask Claudine a rather cheeky question. Claudine, yes. you've been in the media recently. What can, yes. which, which parts of your work attracted media interest? Yeah, so that actually was a fortuitous work um, in multiple myeloma, which is not a solid tumour, but a blood cancer, where we, um, through, through the work that we had done, we'd identified a protein to be elevated in myeloma, hadn't been identified before, is a surface protein and, and is now showing really promising uh, potential to be used as a prognostic for um, poor outcome for patients. So the idea here is that um, instead of the, the quite time-consuming genetic um, analysis of myeloma patients, we are hoping that maybe a very quick flow cytometry assay that can be done within a few hours can identify the poorest or the patients with the poorest predicted outcome and then get them onto the treatment straight away. And we're actually learning a lot about what treatments are best for those patients. So that's another story, um, but, but it's showing really good promise. Great. Well, it shows the, um, the breadth and the depth of your work too. Fantastic. Mm. Oh, now there is a question uh, from an unknown, A105, whatever your number is. Have you looked at the effect of ICAM inhibition in melanoma mouse model progression? Great question. So we're just actually generating our CRISPR knockout uh, cell lines. Uh, so by the end of the year, we will have an answer to that. Um, we'll, we're targeting that in uh, breast cancer and melanoma. Great, okay. Thank you very much, Claudine. Um, Thanks for having little, me. We can do a little round of applause uh, quietly like that. <laughs> Um, and uh, now my second great pleasure uh, for today is to introduce you to Professor Natasha Harvey. Um, and she's head of the Lymphatic Development Laboratory, also in the Centre for Cancer Biology. Uh, you'll also find her in the Bradley Building in one of those high level areas uh, in, the, in the Adelaide Biomed City Precinct. So if you need to uh, find her, she's, she's there. Um, Natasha um, has also is a Adelaide Australia trained and has uh, had extensive international experience as well. Um, has come back to to work here, particularly with um, Professor Sharad Kumar, who many of you know. Um, and uh, she's had lots of awards, a Flory Fellowship to come back here, and to establish her independent research group um, in lymphatic vasculature. So that's enough from me. Over to you, Natasha, if you want to start sharing your screen. Um, and we'll have the same process. Um, attendees are here, and I'll be quiet and let you weave your magic. Great. Thank you, Susan. And thanks, Tamara and John, for the invitation to give you an overview of the research program in my lab. We focus on understanding how the lymphatic vasculature is built during development and how defects in this process give rise to human lymphatic vascular diseases. So the lymphatic vasculature is an integral component of our cardiovascular system. 
and uh, it fulfills crucial roles in fluid homeostasis, in lipid absorption from the digestive tract, and in immunity. And lymphatic vessels pictured here in this cartoon in green are responsible for picking up the fluid that's extruded from our bloodstream every day and transporting it back to the bloodstream via lymphatic ducts that meet up with the jugular veins uh, in the jugular region of our bodies. And en route to the blood vasculature, the lymph is transported via lymph nodes, which are organizing centers of immune responses, thereby enabling our bodies to survey the contents of fluid drained from the periphery back to the bloodstream. And to fulfill these functions, lymphatic vessels are exquisitely specialised. So fluid enters the lymphatics at the level of the initial lymphatic vessels. The cells that comprise these vessels have uh, loose button-like junctions, and they're anchored into the matrix by these anchoring elastin-rich filaments, which enables these cells to respond to changes in tissue fluid accumulation, open up the junctions and allow the influx of fluid to this part of the lymphatic vasculature. From here, lymph is transported via the collecting lymphatic vessels, which are really specialised for lymph propulsion. They're invested with vascular smooth muscle cells that contract to pump lymph back to the bloodstream. And they're also invested with these specialised valves, lymphatic valves, which just like the valves in pipes and veins and our hearts, make sure that lymph only transports effectively one way. So if any part of the lymphatic vascular doesn't work, we see serious problems and talk more about those. So this is cartoon format. This is what lymphatic vessels look like in the ear skin of an adult mouse. The initial lymphatics are marked here with a blue tag. They drain their contents into the collecting lymphatics, which have much less expression of this particular marker and are invested with these red labeled uh, muscle cells, which wrap themselves around the collecting lymphatics to aid lymph transport back to the bloodstream. So we're particularly interested in understanding how the growth and development of lymphatic vessels is regulated in order to try and develop new therapeutics for lymphatic vascular disease. And uh, there are many, many diseases that lymphatics are associated with, but perhaps the best recognised of these is lymphedema. So lymphedema occurs when the lymphatic vasculature just does not work to transport fluid back to the bloodstream. And what you can see here in a young patient with primary or inherited lymphedema is that the fluid accumulates in these affected limbs, but secondarily, uh, these limbs become chronically inflamed and uh, fibrotic and uh, are, have excessive adipose tissue accumulation. So it becomes a very complex problem that we currently have no effective treatments for. While primary or inherited lymphedema is relatively rare, secondary lymphedema is much more common. And this is a particular problem for cancer patients who undergo lymph node removal surgery as part of their cancer treatment, which disrupts lymphatic vessel transport. So as an example, up to 25% of uh, breast cancer patients are susceptible to developing secondary lymphedema after lymph node removal. So when lymphatic vessels don't grow and develop properly in utero, the edema or accumulation of fluid here can have really severe consequences, particularly if it's in the thoracic region, which interrupts heart and lung function. So uh, primary lymphatic vascular anomalies, which include cystic hygroma or non-immune hydrops fatalis, often are associated with a high rate of stillbirth. So my lab is very interested in understanding the genetics that leads to each of these conditions in order to understand how gene dysfunction causes lymphatic vascular anomalies and primary lymphedema. 
But lymphatic vessels are also implicated in a myriad of other human pathologies. We've known for a long time that tumour cells can metastasize to different parts of the body by accessing the lymphatic vascular highway and using this as a transport route. Recent work has shown that by promoting the growth and function of new lymphatic vessels in a glioblastoma model, mouse model that actually anti-tumor immunity is promoted due to the carriage of effective immune cells by effective lymphatics. Lymphatic vessel growth is promoted in settings of inflammation like infection and organ transplant. Lymphatic vessel dysfunction is associated with obesity in mouse models. And we think with the adipose tissue accumulation that occurs in lymphedema patients. Lymphatic vessels are important for lung inflation at birth and lymphatic vessel function in the heart. You can see the lymphatics here covering the surface of the embryonic heart in yellow are very important in promoting tissue regeneration uh, following myocardial infarction. And a very new area of research in our field is studying the meningeal lymphatics and their very important role in clearing waste products from the CSF and the brain. So the field has really seen an explosion in recent years. And my lab is particularly interested in understanding how lymphatic vessel identity is first programmed during development. And of course, endothelial cell identity like the identity in other parts of our bodies is programmed by molecular switches called transcription factors that bind to DNA to turn genes on and off. And work from a number of groups in recent years has identified transcription factors that are enriched in arteries, veins and lymphatic vessels and are important for turning on the gene expression programs in each of those vessel compartments. So the approach my lab took a number of years ago now to identify new transcriptional regulators was to compare the genes expressed by lymphatic vessels in the embryonic skin to those of blood vessels from embryonic skin. And one of the genes we identified here was a transcription factor called GATA2. Now GATA2 has well-established roles in hemopoiesis, the generation of blood cells, but we didn't know anything about GATA2 function in the lymphatic vasculature. And these studies were really promoted when our colleagues at CCP, uh, Hamish Scott and his team found mutations in GATA2 that underlie a human primary lymphedema syndrome known as Emberger syndrome. So these patients have hemopoietic cell abnormalities that often result in myelodysplasia or acute myeloid leukemia, but they also have primary lymphedema. And this tells us that GATA2 must be doing something important in lymphatic vessels. So we set out to establish what role that is and to cut a very long story very short, what we showed was that GATA2 is critically important for the development of valves within the lymphatic vasculature. So these are the lymphatic vessels, collecting lymphatic vessels that drain the digestive tract in the embryonic um, mouse, and the valve developing territories are marked by these levels of high prox expression. What we found when we used a genetic model to delete GATA2 from all endothelial cells was that these valve territories never organized properly and in fact valves were never built. And so the lymphatic vasculature of these mice just didn't function properly and uh, the mouse actually ends up dying due to, to lethal lymphatic defects. So we really wanted then to understand how does GATA2 coordinate the programming of valve endothelial cell identity. And to do this, Jan Kazimwadel in the lab embarked on a program of mapping. So genome-wide mapping of the areas in our DNA where GATA2, as well as three other transcription factors important for valve development, bind. And this gives us a readout of the genes that are regulated by these transcription factors. And what we found from these data sets is a list of candidate genes that we think are likely to underlie primary lymphedema in humans or uh, fetal lymphatic vascular anomalies. 
new genes that are important for valve development, and non-coding regions of the genome that are important for regulating gene expression, which when mutated can also cause lymphatic disease. So I'm going to talk to you only about one of these target genes we've identified very briefly today, and that is FAT4. So we were particularly interested when FAT4 uh, came out of these analyses to, uh, as a really strong candidate of a, being a GATA regulated gene, because FAT4 mutations were recently described in another primary human lymphedema syndrome called Hennequin syndrome. So as well as, as prominent lymphedema, these patients also have neurodevelopmental defects. But we were interested to understand what the role of FAT4 is in the lymphatic vasculature. FAT4 is a huge cadherin. It's prominent on the surface of cells, and uh, we have shown that it's in lymphatic endothelial cells. And its established roles to the point where we joined this project were in planar cell polarity, that is regulating the organisation of planes of cells within tissues and regulation of the hippo pathway an evolutionary conserved regulator of tissue growth and what we did again was to employ a genetic mouse model to ask what happens to lymphatic vascular development when we remove the function of fat4 completely and what we see is these embryos have prominent subcutaneous edema just like patients and their lymphatic vessels in the embryonic skin are mispatterned. When we looked at the process of valve development, what we saw was that in contrast to normal mice where we see valve forming territories in collecting lymphatic vessels, these were far fewer in number and also in maturity in mice that were deficient for FAT4. And we went on to show that this is as a result of a requirement for FAT4 within lymphatic endothelial cells themselves. So how is FAT4 regulating this process of cell organisation within the lymphatic vasculature. Through a lot of work, Kelly Betterman in the lab showed that it's due to the control of cell polarity or the organisation of cell shape within tissues. And using two different measures, she showed that FAT4 deficient cells are unable to coordinate their polarity. And in fact, in a lot of work that I won't talk about, she showed that this is in response to a mechanical signal, which is very important in vessels, and that is flow. So normally cells elongate to build long elongated vessels when they're exposed to flow, but in fat for mutant embryos, these cells don't elongate, they remain round, and as a result, we build very dysfunctional vessels that don't coordinate valve development properly. So they are two of the projects uh, currently ongoing in the lab. We're excited to identify the role of new GATA2 target genes and also very interested to understand how FAT4 coordinates mechanical signals uh, in the lymphatic vasculature. So it remains to thank the very talented team who've been involved in all of this work. This is where you can find us in the magnificent Bradley Building. We collaborate widely with scientists and clinicians nationally and internationally, and we're funded by the NHMRC and ARC. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Natasha. That was so good to uh, take the time to sit and listen to what you all get up to. Um, it's fantastic. Natasha, what specifically are you working on at the moment? Well, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of hoping that you're working on the sort of the adult brain one, the, the dementia one, because I quite like the image of having my uh, lymphatic system flush out all the crap in my head but you know that's probably telling you too much information well that's that's a very important part of sleeping at night uh, uh -huh. and a very active area of research as you might expect lymphatic vessel function diminishes with aging so anything we can do to preserve that function is a good thing. Um, but one of the really exciting projects we're working on at the moment in the lab is another really great collaboration with Hamish and his team, where he has uh, identified a gene that when mutated causes stillbirth due to lymphatic vessel 
abnormalities during development. And, and we've been able to show that this gene indeed is actually another gene that's important for building valves in the lymphatic vasculature. So we're currently preparing that work for publication. Fantastic. Look, that's great. Um, we are at, uh, at the end of the half hour. These are really short snips to uh, give people a, a flavour of, um, of the work, the fantastic work that's been done in the Adelaide Biomed um, City Precinct. So I think everybody will join me quietly in uh, thanking Natasha and Claudine for some great overviews of their work. Uh, and I encourage uh, listeners either who are here with us live or who listen to this in the future to really get in touch. I can commend both of these women to you. They are fantastically approachable um, human beings and also great researchers. So thanks everybody for coming and uh, we'll see you again next week. Thanks Susan. Thanks everyone. Thank Bye. you. Have a good week. Bye.